But there was a point <laughs> at which Greg quit the band, and I was pretty, uh, uh, I was, I was hurt because he just phoned me, and I thought, you know, we've had a very close partnership and friendship for thirty some odd years, and you just quit over the phone. Jim, welcome to the Gen's Talk podcast. Thank you very much. I'm nice so to excited be here. to have this conversation with you. Thanks. You're a legend. <laughs> I don't feel like a legend, but thank you very much. <laughs> when someone says that to you, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? Oh, the first thing that comes into my mind is I'm not a legend. But, <laughs> but I, I understand because I have admiration for artists uh, in my life too. And, mm. uh, and I remember meeting Jackson Brown and being, <laughs> and being tongue-tied. And if I wasn't with a friend... He wouldn't. He wouldn't have known I was in a band or that I had a record that right. I wanted him to sign. <laughs> so I, I'm not suggesting that you're like that, but I, I understand what it is to have art mean something to you. Yeah. Well, it's powerful, right? It moves people. It mm -hmm. inspires them. It motivates them. It resonates with them. Sometimes when you're in your lowest of moments, you know that one musician's piece of art picks you up right. and gets you through whatever you're you're going through. And um, as I sort of looked through just even the comment section of some of your posts online, you know, you could see that come through. And obviously you carry a ton of weight in that space and just the, the beautifully crafted career that you've had. Um, but I'm curious because what I want to know is not necessarily just about the career and the ups, but who's Jim, the man behind the persona that people see online, the, that they see in the shows? Who's Jim? You know that's a difficult question. You probably <laughs> ask that a lot, and you know that's a difficult question because there's a lot of me that is represented in what I do. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, there's a lot of me that's that's private. I mean, I have a family. I have a wife, a very long time relationship over 30 years i think i read 40 years we sell me 40 years of marriage wow next saturday so uh or Jan Jan june 8th anyways 40 years of marriage and we've been to get we were together uh, six years before that mm -hmm. so so i am a product of my okay my parents were from rural settings but mm -hmm. were very much urban people my mother did not want to she was from Prince Edward County. She did not want to remain there for her life. My dad was from Strathroy. He wanted to have a bigger life. Was a Second World War pilot, came back, wanted to have a separate life. I am a product of my dad's rigidity and his stoicism and my mom's open, loving, embracing of life, music. You know, she was a singer. She sang with a big band in university. And then... I think significantly, I'm a product of my dad's complete disillusionment with the corporate world and his stopping doing everything for two years and then creating his life for as small as he could make it. I mean, my parents separated. He got a little, he got a little bachelor apartment. He had a very dignified life. He, he bought into a little wire factory. He had a very small, manageable life. And he was never, n my parents were never discouraging about my choice of being an artist. They were very encouraging. My dad was always worried, you know, about success. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember we'd play Ontario Place way back when, before the amphitheater, and it'd be full. And then the next year, my dad would come up to me and say, there doesn't seem to be as many cars in the parking lot. And I'm like, that's not, <laughs> more people have come other ways. It's still yeah. full. I mean, it's like, full is full. But he was more worried about that. And, um, but I think that those things are very fundamental for me because because I took a path in my life that nobody in my family had ever taken. Yeah. And I didn't do it, I didn't say, okay, I'm not having anything to do with that world. I thought I was gonna go to law school. I, I, was, I wanted to devote some time to music because mm -hmm. I loved music. And one thing, you know, I, I, I had acceptance at a couple of law schools and I, I just kept deferring and deferring, and then I realized I can't do this. I can't step out of this world that I discovered, this music world, and be 
a lawyer or be anything in business. It's just not. It's not who you are. Not who I I I am at all, and certainly not who I was. Is there ever? Is there was there ever a time where you thought you made the wrong decision? Not really, you know, because almost right away I found some way to. I never thought I was going to be able to rely on music to make my living, so I I got into doing props and sets for TV commercials. Mm -hmm. So working at a production house, and that was how my wife and I bought our first house, had our first kid, bought a car, all that kind of stuff. So I never had any pressure on music to make money. Okay, and I never did. We never did, you know, Greg was a waiter or we made enough money, but we never did things just for money as Blue Rodeo. We only did it to be a good band. Yeah. And so those things were very, they were good decisions. Like I look back and think, yeah, I mean, if I'd never made it in music, I still would have done something in production, but I never would have had to give up music. Yeah. And that was a big deal. Like when we had, when we had one child, then two children, Obviously, it was very difficult because we were succeeding and we were away a lot. But if that hadn't happened, I still would have been part of music. I'm curious, when you talked about your dad's stoicism and rigidity, being a World War II pilot, uh, and I can only imagine what those stories were like. But I'm curious, did his rigidity and stoicism ever conflict with your mom's nature? <laughs> well, they divorced. So it, it did because... My dad, when my dad went through his his, uh, his disillusionment period, he was pretty somber and you know didn't didn't participate in life very much. And yes, so that was their undoing. Mm. But strangely, or maybe not strangely, my dad's sense of honor and dignity was so high that that my mother, uh, they had about ten years where they were apart, and then. Rena and I, my wife and I, had a child, and they started to babysit together, and that turned into they remarried. Wow! I know they they always said they did it for they never lived together again, but they remarried. They do trips together. They just they went through a period of time where they didn't yeah. want to be married. And how did his rigidity and stoicism? Because those are very specific words yeah. that you used. How did that impact you as a child? It was hard as a child because he was he was he was difficult. He was angry a lot, and and I, I was he did not approve of m me because I was irresponsible as a child, and, and mm. you know, I ran with a crowd and all that kind of stuff. But as an adult, and especially with this endeavor of the band, my dad embraced it with open arms, and he was he was, you know, you can have a rigid parent, but when that rigid parent's on your side. That's a good thing, hmm. you know. And yeah. my dad was always loyal and and on my side. Yeah. And so, he was a very different, older person than he was a younger man. I think when he was younger man, he he did what a lot of those guys did. He 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 uh, joined Second World War, did his thing, came out, went to university, got a job, had a family. None of that was some. He didn't sit down and think this is what I want to do. Yeah, he just did it. And so. I think that when he was, when later in life, when he was free of those things and his family were grown up and, and he was apart from my mom, I think that he just became a much softer, you know, guy. But he was still himself. Yeah. He could still say brutal things, you know, <laughs> brutal, <laughs> honest things. But but it was, you know, it was, it was good having a guy like that on, on my side. And he was, he would come to see us. Like he, he had friends, old war friends that he'd come to see in Ottawa and he'd, they'd always come to the gig and... Mm. Here's a story about my dad. So, when we, my dad, when my parents were still separated, I was living in New York. So Greg and I and my wife Rena lived in New York for mm -hmm. three years, eighty-one to eighty-four. She was at acting school. Greg and I had a band. So we'd come back and forth to Canada, but of course we had no working papers. So we just, you know, we just went in. So my dad said he'd drive me to Buffalo. Usually we'd take uh, the cheaper airlines from Buffalo to New York. So. I get in the car with my dad. I'm going back, and it's like, I don't know, September or something like that. And we're driving along, and he drives right by the airport turnoff, right? And I'm like, what's going on? And he said to me, do you have to be back today? I said, no, not really. Okay. So he just keeps driving. He just keeps driving, just keeps driving. I don't really know what's going on, but I assume he's driving me either to a closer airport or driving me all the way to New York. We stop somewhere, probably around Syracuse, gets a motel. 
We get some beer. I've never had a beer with my dad. <laughs> we watch a ball game. We go out for a steak. It's all new territory to me. I've never been a friend of my dad. Yeah. Anyway, that was weird enough, but he drives me the next day into New York. Rena and I lived in Little Italy, so we're right at the sort of bottom of the Holland Tunnel. Pretty busy. He drives, gets on our street, small little street, pulls up in front of the apartment. I realize he's not getting out. I'm like, do you want to come in? And see how the apartment said, no, I got to go. So I get out with my bag, shake his hand, off he drives. <laughs> he doesn't even get out of the car in New York City, to which he's driven me over two days. And that, that was my dad, you know? What do you think prompted that? I think it. I think those things were true. I think he did not want to get out in a busy city. He wanted to get out of there. He knew the Holland Tunnel was right around the corner. He had no interest. You know, he wanted to drive me because he likes driving and he didn't mind spending time with me. Mm. I was used to that kind of stuff. I don't think it was to be hurtful. Yeah. I think it was to be practical. And that's what my dad was. Which almost takes a, a level of self-awareness to know that that was him just being his most authentic self mm -hmm. versus making it about you and going, why is he doing this to me? He couldn't oh, even, yeah. you know, like that's such a beautiful moment to, for him to say, you know, like just unspoken, I'm going to drive you over two days. Like that's <laughs> not a short trip. <laughs> no, I know. No, I know. And it, you know, what could I say? Cause he just driven me to New York. Yeah. And that was, that's a, that's a gift. Absolutely. And that saved, I mean, money was, I didn't have a lot of money then. That probably would have cost me. Those are the days of People Express and, and United Air, which was 50 bucks to go from Buffalo to, <laughs> to uh, but I mean, that saved me that money. And yeah, it was just, it was just practical. And, you know, I think that I was at a point, of, first of all, I was very independent in my life at that point. Yeah. And I was, I was kind of at a point where I, I admired that story. I thought, you know, my dad is not a lovey-dovey guy, hmm. but he is very loyal and helpful. And, you know, he drove me all the way here. So, how does that shape how you are as a father today? Or how you were as a father when you first started becoming a father? Because I'm curious about how you look at fatherhood today after being a father for how, I, I don't know how old your children are, but... 37, yeah. So for after 37 years yeah. of fatherhood, you've learned a yeah. thing or two. But when you first became a father, what was maybe the, the thing you told yourself you were going to do or not going to do that your dad did or didn't? Very good question. Um, <laughs> that uh, Because I did not want to be the kind of father my dad was. I, I wanted to be a much more open, loving father. And so I was much more affectionate, affectionate with my children. Um, I didn't have the baggage my dad did. I wasn't a Second World War pilot. I didn't, I wasn't, yeah. you know, I didn't have any of that stuff. And that's not an easy thing to, like, that's, you can't dismiss the fact no. that he went to war yeah. in one of the biggest wars on the planet ever. Yeah. Yeah. And for him to do that, come back, and to your point, just get a job and go yeah. to university and just pretend like, yeah. He's got to figure out a normal life. Yeah. That's... But that was, I mean, even when my parents would, uh, my parents would babysit, I had to say to my dad, because there would be certain things the kids would do that would f irritate him. Sure, yeah. And he would lose his temper. <laughs> and I'd say, you can't do that. Mm. Like, you can't blow up at them. And I remember asking my, Devin, when he was in bed, I said, are you afraid of grandpa? And he went, no. Why would I be? I thought, okay, that's just me. Yeah, that's just <laughs> that's me. your childhood. That's just through. my childhood. You don't yeah. think you think of him as this funny character. Yeah, and uh, so I just wanted to be different. I wanted to break the chain of of anger in the house, and and uh, uh, that you know that definitely had some negative effects on everybody in my household. Just yeah. being on pins and needles when my dad was around when we were young. So I wanted to break that and have my kids feel comfortable in the house and be represent themselves if they wanted, talk back if they wanted, you know, yeah. do all that stuff that we were certainly not allowed to do. So if your son was sitting in front of me today, what would he, how would he describe you as a father? Well, essentially, I'm depends curious. which son. <laughs> okay. Because I'm curious yeah. if you feel like you've succeeded in, in that goal of being a more affectionate version of your father. I think that I've succeeded in being a more affectionate, open, but I don't think that I've succeeded in being all the father I wanted to be. I think that I have been, I have natural tendencies to be critical. I have a natural tendency to be a bit aloof. And so all those things I've tried to, to do something about, but I don't know that. I think my kids would say that I was a good father, hmm. but I, I, they wouldn't say I was perfect. 
Of course. And I and I had anger. You know, when I was younger, I I, I had the same kind of anger anger issues my dad did. Hmm. And so, but I got over that. You know, I think my wife sort of talked that out of me. <laughs> well, it's incredible what a a loving, compassionate relationship can do for mm-hmm. a man mm-hmm. in terms of just getting you to see outside yourself a little bit, to see what your flaws are, but also not feel like the fact that she's pulled your flaws out and said, hey, by the way, these are the the issues that you need to work through doesn't make you feel any less than by the end of it. No, no. No, my wife's fiery and independent and and not... There were just certain things that she just wouldn't put up with. And, and, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I mean, it's funny to look back now because we have grown-up children now. Adult children are so enjoyable and, you know, and for the most part. And... uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, and, uh, we've, we've certainly minimized how difficult the times were sometimes when I was traveling so much, the kids were young. Um, we trying to fit in everything we want to do as a family plus respond to our individual careers. You know, there were, there were tense times all, you know, for a long time. Yeah. Is there, what would be the biggest lesson you've taken away from this whole experience? Your father your wife, being a father, if there was one lesson that you were to, if someone comes up to you and says, I'm about to be a father, and I'm asking this because Father's Day is just around the corner, there's a lot of new dads out there, mm-hmm. or dads that are struggling that want to become better ver- better fathers, what advice would you share with them? Well, I think that the most important thing is to be present, you know, and mm-hmm. I mean, I could, I could be extremely present when I was there, but I was away a lot. Mm-hmm. And so I hear stories about that now i think i tried to minimize my summer work so that i and and maximize my winter work when i wouldn't be missed as much but i would honestly say all you can do because you can't not be yourself all you can do is be there right and as much as you can and i was there as much as i could be i mean i had to make a living for us and i had to respond to my career opportunities Um, I don't think it would have been realistic to to turn away from that so um, how did you balance it all how how did you becoming a full time musician touring making music producing music everything that comes with it being available for your fans cultivating a a a healthy lifestyle a balanced lifestyle is extremely difficult because when you're diving into a craft you're giving it everything and then when you're with your children and your family you want to give it everything but mm-hmm. you can't give both a hundred percent so how did you balance well i think that what my wife and i did at a certain point what at, at a crisis point was to develop rules let's we'll say can't be away longer than three weeks uh have to be have to allow two to four weeks and sometime in the four four months of summer that we do stuff as a family. Um, we had to get full-time help. Mm. That that was important. Um, I mean, we just developed rules. And, uh, and what happens is, as you abide by those rules, things get easier. As you move along in your career, you get a lot more control over what you, you do mm. and, and your schedule. And, uh, and the only thing I would say that would also balance that particular uh, uh, method is that my wife and I both thrive on activity. She does too. And uh, so we are very active people. So even if we have this time, we fill it with something. And she, although she would say I was more active, that's not true. She's very active. She does a lot of, she puts on a play a year. She does all this beautiful art. She's always doing something. So Mm. that's the type of people we are. So we have to accept that in each other too. We have to say, look, we can't, we're not sit around people. And we're not going to sit around and watch our children throw a ball around. So <laughs> that we better figure something out. Right. So, you know, we tried to, we took our kids on. I think the first time we took our kids, we took them out of school in 97 when I think our son was 10. We had three kids at that point. Our youngest was five. Took him to Italy for a month. And uh, we continued that like we would go on these trips as long as we as long as we had this the three of them so we balanced it by doing these trips and um by making that time substantial Mm. whenever we were together 
it would be at least for three weeks or something, and we'd be somewhere that we had to cope all as a family. So, so when you talk about being present, being the advice that you would give, and the efforts that your wife and yourself took to make sure that you got to spend the quality time, do you regret not having more time as your kids were getting older? One conversation I've had, and, and I'll preface the question by explaining where it's coming from, one conversation I've had with my parents consistently has been around how they felt that they weren't around enough when I was growing up because they had to work all the time. Right. And so I've been asking more and more people this question who have kids, and the answer seems to be generally the same. We didn't get enough time, and right. kids grow up way too fast. Well, there's that's true. I mean, I think that now. I think that events come and go too fast. Here's what I would say. Had I become a lawyer... I have lawyer friends that are my age, mm -hmm. and they work 80 hours a week because they bill their billable hours. So they work hard. I'm not sure it would have been better for me to be living in the same house with my family, but never there. Mm. I think that what happened was, for me, it was all or nothing. So they knew that January, February, March, I was going to be around very little. But then they knew that in the summer or you know, if there was a trip that I could take them on, uh, or we planned something together, they knew that they would have 100% of my time. Mm -hmm. So that was the way we worked it out because that's what we had. That was what that was the opportunity we had. And so I think, because recently my youngest son has, he said to me, I never realized how much you were away until Devin and Emma, his older brother and sister, were away at university. And then he said it was just me and mom every night. And so that made me feel, that made my heart drop a little bit. Mm. Um, but I, I don't, I think that what they also remember is the, is the big times that we, the events we did together. Yeah. And I've also been, I think Rena and I have been very lucky that we do a lot of stuff together now because they're adult musicians. And we, we help with the, this, uh, endeavor that raises money for it used to be Olympic athletes but now for music counts which is a music charity mm -hmm. and we go on these high end trips that people pay a premium and and we're the musical guests and so we've done these things all around the world with our two sons sometimes with our daughter mm -hmm. so we've created alternate ways of being together and we've been together a lot I mean to the point where I think that they're probably tired of us a little bit you know <laughs> family events don't mean the same anymore <laughs> But it, I think that, I honestly think that we tried to th create alternatives because it was not going to be every weekend I was home. It mm -hmm. was not going to be that. And so we just tried to create alternatives. And can we talk about the music career a little bit? A long storied career doesn't happen without its fair share of challenges along the way. I've had conversations with numerous artists who've talked about almost quitting the day or the week before <laughs> something finally broke through and right. worked for them. Can you think back to a time where something like that maybe happened to you? Well, you've caught me at a good time because we're we're just um, we're making a documentary or somebody's making a documentary about blues. So we've been all over all the phases of our band and. Initially, when they said, well, you know, the other band members, because we were interviewed individually, mm -hmm. said, well, they, they were talking about the ups and downs. And I was like, ups and downs? We've had pretty straight trajectory. And then they started talking about all these things. And I thought, yeah, we've had a lot of ups and downs. <laughs> I have just somehow smoothed them out. Yeah, I think that what was beneficial to us was when we started, we did not have high expectations of getting a recording contract or doing it. We'd, Greg and I had been Toronto and New York for like seven or eight years not really getting anywhere. So we really just wanted to be a good band mm -hmm. and play in the bars and, and make our living some other way. So when things started to happen, we we didn't just jump at them and just quit our jobs and say, okay, here we go, now we're going to the top. We just went very gradually. We had, for the first five years of our band, we had a postman as our drummer, and he kept his job. I mean, we could do... The postal, the postal service was on strike a lot, so we could go touring <laughs> during the strikes. But otherwise, we had to have him back. So we could do weekends, but we had to have him back 
at his post at about five o'clock in the morning, Monday morning. Oh, wow. So we could play Friday because he was usually done in the afternoon, Friday, Saturday, and even Sunday. And then we'd drive back. And as long as we dropped him at his, his mailbox by five, he have his uniform, off he'd go. So we kept this very sane balance of, of you know, fulfilling expectations, but not letting them get too high. Mm. The things that have happened to us have been more about individuals, health, and psychology. I think that sometimes we've had things that have interrupted us with individuals' health, and we've had people thinking they didn't want to do this anymore. Mm. And those have been tough to get over, but in the end, each time, maybe happened three times, the will to to stay together and make music together was stronger than the will to break it apart and, and, and go. Was there ever a point where you wanted to just walk away from it? I realized <laughs> from this documentary that no, I've never, I mean, I, I've done things defensively. Okay. Like I, when, when my partner went to make a solo record and really tell anybody, I thought he might not come back. Mm-hmm. So I better uh, do the same. I went to the record company, made a deal. It's all good. I'm, I was used to that at that point. I made a solo record. And I thought, oh, this is fun. I like this. So that was '98, and I've just kept it up every, you know, every five years or so. Um, so that to me was a bit of a failsafe. Like I thought, if everybody wants to quit, if it's too much for everybody, and I think that too much sometimes is about personal troubles, but sometimes it's just about fatigue. Mm. Sometimes it's just about we've just done this 300 times this year and I can't get on that bus. I can't see your face. I just can't do it anymore. Yeah. So sometimes it's just that and you do get over that. But sometimes it's different. Sometimes it is deeper personal problems that need to be sorted out. But there was always in the back of my mind that, that okay, I do want to stay with this. I like this band. I love this band. I love these people. But if they don't want to do it, I'm also okay. Mm. I'm okay to continue on with what I'm doing. You found a way to at least maintain a connection to the thing that you enjoyed doing that didn't rely on other people being present for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Was there pushback for going solo? No, I wasn't the first one. Okay. Greg went solo first. Would you have gone solo if Greg didn't? I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. I was very I was very nervous about doing it to begin with. And then when I started doing it I thought this is what I've been doing for 10 years. Why do I, why am I worried about this? Right. I write songs and I record them with people. So it was easy after the first one. So I probably would have at some point. Yeah. But it would have been more of a vanity project than a necessity. It mm. was a necessity at the beginning. How do you balance the, speaking of vanity, ego of it all? You know, it's one thing when you're a solo artist and you start to see the notoriety grow, you see the audience, you see the fame, you see the money, your ego grows just alongside of that and can take over. Um, And when you're in a band, you're dealing not just with your own ego, but the egos of two, three, four, five, you name it. How How do you work through managing egos? And managing might not be the right word because it assumes that you're managing everybody, but how do you, how do you, I guess coexist with other egos in an environment like that? Well, first of all, I think that you need to have a pretty good ego to to be an artist. Mm. You you need to be able to care about communicating what you're thinking, what you've made to other people. We didn't start Blue Rodeo until we were almost 30. Mm. So we'd had a lot of years of, of people being indifferent to us as musicians that's helpful. Humbling. It's well. It's just that you think you know when it does start to happen, you think I wouldn't get too high on this yeah. because it could either end or you know or uh, anyway it could vanish. But we are pretty good within our group of trying to maintain a a realistic expectation of what people do for us, right? And people do a lot for us, and we're. We, we're very, we do a lot of checks and balances on each other. And the way that we each deal with the public is we, I think we sort of have a method for that too, because we've all, we've all been around people that abuse that. 
mm-hmm. that are arrogant, that are that that are get snippy with with fans or something, and we really come down on each other about that. You know, don't turn that moment that the person wants to have with you into something bad. Yeah, just be normal. Just be reasonable. Just be polite. It's not. You don't have to spend an hour with them. Just be nice. And so I think that for us, because we got to it a little later and because we have very reasonable people in the band, we have coped with that, I think, pretty well. I think that we've always tried to be honorable and uh, not abuse our privilege, of which we have lots, and, um, and recognize that there's a lot of there's a lot of fantasy in in music admiration. Mm-hmm. You know, there's not it's not really about you. It's about what somebody imagines from how they've participated in the music. And how they perceive you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we, I I'm sort of the I'm sort of the uh, uh what do they call it with Adivar or the uh, I'm I'm just Oh, sort the of, avatar? I'm the avatar. Yeah. I'm just the avatar. And I I know that like I have artists I admire, and I project a lot of things onto them because I learn things in their songs, yeah. and I and they they make sense of certain things for me. But I understand it's not necessarily them, and so we have to caution ourselves about that. Hmm. Is there a difference between Jim the artist and Jim the human? I I would assume I I think probably I think that I you know I I wasn't. A, naturally uh, extroverted um, musician when I started. Mm. I was very self-conscious speaking on stage. I I can see myself in early interviews being, you know, nervous about <laughs> what I'm going to say. Yeah. And I think you just learn how to communicate and and uh, and just not um, not put on a false front. Just say what you mean and, right. and and carry on so yeah. i would imagine that yes i think that my family recognizes it when we're walking around and people recognize me and they usually like i probably go into jim the artist mode mm. and uh and they just walk away like they've, they've had enough of that <laughs> but then i come back to who i am and it's it's not a it's not a gigantic transition yeah. it's just I'm a little bit more respectful of of people that might come up to me and and uh, or anybody you know in Canada. <laughs> you gotta be, you know, just just be respectful of of the public in general. Was there ever a point in time where the persona was so strong that you had a hard time separating the two? No, I don't think so. There's times when I got tired of being in my. I I got tired of the persona. Mm. I mean, it's it it can be wearing um after a while and you you can't you have to be careful to not take offense and there's certain things that people do that can can i can feel my back get up like i don't Mm. like being grabbed and that kind of stuff and yeah just have to be calm about it sure yeah but i think it's just that again it just comes from being tired do you look back on it all and go this was all worth it especially after the like the, I mean, maybe that's not the right question here. I'm thinking from the lens of the times where you look back on the career, and you go, I've done all of these incredible things. I've managed to, to keep balance with my family. Were the lows ever that low, I guess, is the question I'm really asking. Like, were they so low that you just thought, maybe this is it, maybe I'm done. I think that there have been lows that have knocked me off my feet pretty hard, but I have had a very smart and supportive wife and family. What's an example of the low? Well, if you're comfortable sharing. Yeah, yeah, because it's going to come on the documentary anyway. But there was a point (laughs) at which Greg quit the band, and I was pretty, uh, uh, I was, I was hurt because he just phoned me. And I thought, you know, we've had a very close partnership and friendship for 30 some odd years, and you just quit over the phone. So I was really wounded, and I knew that I'd be okay. 
so I wasn't I wasn't devastated, but I was devastated. And that was a point at which, you know, once Rena knew, then Rena was very supportive. You know, what you want is that person to get angry at the other person right away, right? She got I can't believe it. Yeah, it's just <laughs> bullshit. And I, so I'm like, yes, that's good. You're on my team. <laughs> just like you can only support the Leafs. She can only support one side. And then uh, and then my family just kind of rally around. And not in like, oh, we got to help dad. Mm. Just here we are. Let's have a barbecue or something. Right. So I think that it was much tougher in the early years where it would have been confounding. Well, what do I do now? Um but after 98 and after the solo record and, and after, you know, we had sort of established ourselves, then I don't think there was ever a time when I thought this was a mistake. Mm. I never should have done this. No, I think that my love and attach, my love of and attachment to music has, ma has remained constant. And so I would just simply find another way to do it. Okay. Is that the advice you'd give other people? So maybe well, I think artist. that, you know, for young artists, you got to do it because you love it. Yeah. Because if you do it to be famous or to be successful, you will be crushed at some point. But if you do it because you love it, if you love the art, the art of making music, the act of making music, you can't be harmed. You, you can always play somewhere hmm. and you can always sit and write a song and you can you can put your feelings and thoughts into a song so if you do it for the right reasons it's 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 a great companion in life i've heard artists talk about creating music creating art like therapy it's their outlet it's their ability to finally express themselves and maybe finally is not even the case but just the ability to express themselves in a way that is very unique to them it's their it's their language, if you will. Mm. Would you agree with that? Well, I would agree with half of that. I would agree with the fact that music is absolutely the language that we as musicians speak. Mm -hmm. And and I can, when I'm with a bunch of people, I can tell who is moved by that and, and, and how much we can, we share in yeah. that. But in terms of it being a therapy, is a very, it's funny because it's, okay, as a songwriter, Mm -hmm. Not as a musician, but as a songwriter. Okay. You're writing what you think is true. You're writing from your perspective. You are not writing from the perspective of anybody else mentioned in the song. And I've had this discussion with my wife many times. Was she like, why would you have me do that in the third verse? Why, why am I always the one that has to get over my feelings and come to you? you know? And I think, you're right. Then part of me thinks, well, just write it in a play. Then <laughs> you, know, that's, you can have you can have the response. Yeah. <laughs> but I think in terms of therapy, it's just it's too um, it's too one sided to be okay. good therapy. I mean, if you, you're still gonna, have, you know, one of the things we've done in our band is we've had to really learn how to talk. We've had to learn how to open up and talk and and be honest with each other. Yeah. That's not always contained in the music. What's contained in the music is dreams and hopes and, and framework of, of one person's uh, psyche. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's dangerous to think of it as therapy. It might be good. It, it certainly feels good. And, it's a, and, and for all of us, it's a way of, of elevating ourselves and, and keeping ourselves, our spirits buoyant. Yeah. But there's so much more outside of that that you have to learn with your, in your relationships. Yeah. I can certainly see it being a very helpful outlet mm -hmm. more than anything else. Yeah. But I, I completely agree with the point of it's one way. It's a one way street. It's you projecting your thoughts out. And then I think the act of getting it out is the therapeutic part. Yep. yep. But it's not necessarily to your point. It, it might not be the, the truth, right? It's just your version of it. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, <clears throat> in terms of, I want to go back to your dad for just a second, if I may. Sure. Knowing what you know today, as a father, um, as a son, if you could go back in time and talk to your dad when he was a young man, 
What would you say to him? Well, that's, you know, because my dad lost his mother when he was young, like 10 or 11. And so that's obviously had a profound effect on him. Hmm. <clears throat> but going back and talking to my dad as a young man, as I could only observe. I mean, my, my dad was hardly formed and, and, you know, however he was. But I wish that my dad had lasted longer. Um, he died in his 70s. I mean, he would have been way old now. But, but I wish he had been an older man because he was such a great old man. And, he, you know, my wife and I were just talking about this the other day. We were talking about the effect our fathers had on us. And you realize that at a certain point in your life, it doesn't matter. You look back and you think, those things were so critical when I was 25, when I was even 35. But you you have to, in life, accept and sometimes forgive. You know, I mean, maybe the person who is being forgiven doesn't require forgiveness, but mm -hmm. you have to say, though that was the way it was. We all turned out okay. You were who you were for many reasons. And you weren't irretrievable because as a, as a you know, for more than half my life you were fantastic it was a lot of fun mm -hmm. but i think that you have to accept and not everything you know that could be like obviously there are some abusive parents that that have messed up their kids and there's nothing acceptable about that mm -hmm. but in terms of just the general course of of parenting and 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 childhood you have to learn to accept the way people are and i you probably have to learn that with your own contemporaries too yeah. so there is acceptance is a big thing in life and it's not easily gained so okay and uh if you can go back in time and talk to a younger jim <laughs> knowing what you know now about your father yeah at a time when younger jim may almost sounds like was maybe a little resentful of the rigidity that your father was what would you say to young jim I'd say you're right to stay out of his way, you know. Mm. I think that, that this that's what I learned to do was was just s stay out of his way and not not provoke him and uh not uh, not be overly concerned by it, you know. Yeah. And I think that what it helped me do was it helped me lead a very independent life at a very young age. And uh it's not that I didn't have support but I didn't require support. Okay. Built some resilience. Yeah. 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 I'm not giving him credit for that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's like, thanks. <laughs> thanks. But I think that, you know, you all, all families have to cope. And I think that our the three kids in my family, uh, we coped in different ways. Yeah. And I coped by kind of disappearing. And, and, you know, others were more in the line of fire. Hmm. Jim, what do you have coming up right now? You mentioned the documentary. Mm -hmm. What else you got going on in this busy life of yours? Well, the documentary is, uh, I think, just about done. They're just about done all the, uh, the uh, that's all for Blue Rodeo and the history of Blue Rodeo. I have a solo record coming out uh, June 14th. I have a record release party tomorrow, which is June 4th. I have a lot of summer touring all over uh, Canada in uh, with Blue Rodeo, a bit with myself. And then I have a full tour in the fall um with my with my own band and then i think the east will be with my son devin and his band and the west will be with devin and sam our youngest as a duo wow yeah so that, family that, affair that, yeah very cool yeah jim thank you so much for sharing your time with me no, thank listen, you for stopping they, by very nice to talk to you thanks a lot no, this was a pleasure i learned a lot i'm so excited to to see this next path, this next journey. Um, it's really cool that you get to do this with your sons now. I know. I think that's such a unique and amazing experience for them to be able to say, you know, I shared the stage with my dad. You know, like a lot of us uh, as sons, and you can speak to this just as much, just want that core memory with our fathers. Mm -hmm. That's what we live for sometimes. It's just what we want. We want to be able to, you know, look across to our left and say, that's my dad. Yeah. You know, so well, I, I, I like looking across and saying that's my son. So <laughs> I, it's, Amazing. It's nice for me. Jim, thank you so much, sir. I Pleasure. appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.